Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. So today, this is uh, our 10th lecture officially. Uh, we want to finish up with the avascular tumor and uh, talk about chemotaxis. Uh, we may cut the avascular tumor spheroid short a little bit so that we can make sure we get through the chemotaxis as needed. As always, I need to remind people this is live streamed and recorded. And by the way, I have got at least rough cut edits of all the previous lectures done. So if you want to watch them, you should be able to find them online now. So I'd like people to give me a quick uh, project update, as I had asked uh, before the break. And then we'll finish up the tuber spheroid, and then we will jump into chemotaxis which is one of the important mechanisms by which chemical fields and cells interact. We've had chemical fields controlling cell growth a little bit so far, uh, and we've had cells secrete and absorb chemicals, but we haven't had cells move in response to chemicals. So that's what we're going to be focusing on uh, today. So maybe we'll start with student project updates. Uh, Pedro, do you want to lead off for us? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, let me grab the simulation here. So, let me screen share. I hope the sound of the fans is are not like is not too annoying. Uh, so what we had, what what are we the the our objectives until today was to download the simulation from Joshua, um, run it, fix any bugs, and um, uh, and I tried to optimize because there were many redundant loops. And I tried to expand to 3D um, because this is, one of our intentions is to explore explore the simulation in 3D and also because Alex asked me for help. Uh, so I will show what I have. So first, let me extract. So this is the original. It has uh, two diffusive fields, uh, a few steppables, uh, one for the ODE models, one for the cell transition states, and the other ones for metrics. These are for metrics. Uh, <clears throat> here he defines the intracellular pathways, so on and so forth. Yeah, so you can see in the original simulation, this is almost the original simulation. It's like the original without the bugs. Um, this one has some redundant force. For example, the the for loop on 172 is, is redundant with this one. So, uh, collapsing all the fours into a single four is one of the tasks I had to do. I will first run the original. Uh, in the original simulation, it starts with one eclipse cell in the middle. He calls it I1. And so it takes a uh, reasonable long time uh for the simulation to kick 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 in i think and so i also changed so the the middle cell starts um already at i2 so the initial phase is faster uh then it's easier like to explore the simulation because you don't have to wait um that long time in the beginning but of course, for obtaining metrics, it's obviously 
better. It makes more sense to start with Eclipse out in the middle. So this is the cell field. Uh, green is the Eclipse cells. They are they have the virus, but they are not uh, infectious. The red one are in fact infectious, which means they can release viruses and infect neighboring cells. And uh, the yellow are dead cells. So the first one to get infected in the middle is already dead. And we can see the virus field spreading. Every Monte Carlo step is like uh, 10 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. So if we divide this by six, we have the, the, the number of hours elapsed in real world um, units. So about 20 hours, let's say. Okay. Um, what are your next steps? And Emma, are you still working together? Or you, or do you want to add anything to the to to what uh, Pedro is saying? We have it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. You're muted. Uh... Um, we have it on GitHub. So we're also working on making sure we can push the changes to GitHub and then anyone will be able to access the code once we're finished. Um, so that's another detail, but that's not as important as the actual contents of the simulation. So what I've done to this simulation so far is... And so do you have any specific plans for how you want to extend or besides cleaning up the code itself, is there anything you want to try with it or you're still exploring yes. the model at this point? Yes. So uh, it may sound ambitious, but I think it's necessary to exchange the intracellular OD model for another one. And we have we have uh, decent models in the literature, and I will probably combine them um, in a way that is, uh, I mean, doable so for example um this od model has a positive feedback loop of interferon uh there is no evidence in literature for that so i have to switch the model for another one however there are some good ideas in this model for example the cell health uh, is a good idea so uh, uh i think we can try to merge those ideas into a final OD model that we can just substitute in uh, in place of this one and and run the simulation see what happens and the parameters are uh they are halfway done because in the literature um they tune the parameters very well however not necessarily for influenza not necessarily for bronchial epithelial cells, but we will uh, nonetheless start with those parameters. If they need more tuning, I think that's uh, uh, that's a project for the future. Uh, so I think exchanging this, uh, uh, putting another OD model in place of this one, I think that's the that's our plan for expanding this model. So last time we started out talking about uh, avascular tumor spheroid, and we initially worked with a uh, frozen tumor to try to get a sense of what the chemical concentrations were like as we adjusted the uh, uptake by the different cell types and the conversion of one cell type to another. And uh, we stopped more or less when we had a frozen tumor with cell type transitions. And if you don't have the, if you didn't have that working, 
or you don't have it, please download the code from the from two weeks ago uh, in the demos folder and get that up on your computers today because I want to go through the rest of that exercise, but I really I don't want to take too much time on it today. So uh, we then started looking at the diffusion limited growth where the cell growth and death depend on the availability of a critical nutrient. In reality, growth and, and change of cell type depend at least on the availability of glucose and oxygen, and often also on the availability of one or more limiting growth factors. Um, but if you can write a simulation that depends on a single field, then extending it to depend on multiple fields is not that big a deal. Uh, biologically, it's a big deal to change it. Uh, you have more parameters that you have to fit, but uh, in terms of model structure and the way you implement it inside of CompuCell, it doesn't really make much of a difference. And so we talked about uh, at the very end of last time, which is now two weeks ago, we talked about combining uptake and cell growth, and we introduced the idea of arresting metabolism, which is the about, in this case, we're going to just call the critical field oxygen, the limiting field oxygen. Uh, we're going to say that uh, there's a certain limited, a minimal amount of oxygen that's needed to maintain the cell. So you could think of this as the amount of gasoline your car needs to idle without moving. Uh, if you have less than that, then your car will stall. And if you have a limiting nutrient, in this case, we'll use oxygen again, but you could imagine it's glucose. Beyond that, then the cell can use that to do a variety of things. One of the things it can use it to do is grow. And so we want to introduce the idea that the cell, uh, under ideal conditions, could grow at some maximum rate, G, and that's going to be in copy cells, since we don't really have uh, units predefined, it's going to be in voxels per Monte Carlo step. We're going to have to really think about that in terms of the doubling time of the cell. Uh, for mammalian cells, that doubling time is usually not less than 24 hours. Uh, as a practical matter, it could be a couple of days. Uh, maybe if you're, a, if you're talking about... Uh, Blood cancers, leukemia, so the, the doubling times could be a little bit faster. And we're going to say then that the available oxygen after the resting metabolism is uh, zero, uh, the maximum of zero, and the uptake about minus the resting metabolism. So that's the amount of spare oxygen you have. And then you say that the, the cell could grow at a rate that's equal to... Uh, that maximum rate G times some number that depends on the available oxygen. Uh, if the available oxygen is zero, the growth rate will be zero. Uh, the maximum for F should be one. And so that makes the, uh, the function fairly easy. Something like uh, the available oxygen divided by uh, a scale uh, factor S scale plus S uh, is a a function that's always between zero and one, uh, and it's a Michaelis function. We could raise those to 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 a nth power and make it a Hill function if we wanted. Um, and that's not a bad assumption for the the growth to begin with. And so, what I'd like people to do is fire up. We did this already last two weeks ago. I want people to get that running again. Uh, get that diffusion limited growth simulation going. Uh, I, again, I don't want people to take too much time, so I don't want you to write it from scratch. Uh, you can download that exercise, uh, a vascular tuber spheroid, uh, and uh, that should be probably the place to go. But I do want to make sure everybody has that working. And again, for those of you who are on a Mac, when you download that uh, zipped file, the Mac is going to want to unzip it, and you'll have to put the files back into a containing folder for it to work. Uh, 
Alternatively, you can you can I believe tell it not to unzip it when when you download it. Are people able to download the the ten point two avascular tumor and get that to run? Uh, Emma says she's working on her her version of it. Uh, and so if you have a version from two weeks ago that you like, that's fine. Uh, but uh, but uh, for those of you who don't have it, please start with the with the exercise ten underscore two. So if you've got the for those of you who who either are starting with ten point one downloaded once you've got it running or or if you get ahead and you've got it working, um, I I encourage you to try changing the two constants, the metabolism and the scale factor and see how the rates of the growth of the cluster change. Um, and if you if you want to be really ambitious, you can say that uh, dead cells don't, necrotic cells don't take up any oxygen, and the, and the uh, quiescent cells only take up a quarter as much as the uh, proliferating cells. Now it'll change the chemical, that'll change the oxygen field and it'll change the growth pattern. So already with this very simple model, uh, you can do quite a bit. Uh, Emma, how's it going? Um, well, I'm getting bugs because I have a list of oxygen concentrations from the quiescent cells, but at a certain point there are no quiescent cells. So when I try to get the mean of that list, it goes in error. So I need to... So you have to have an if list, before, if len before you. Yeah. But I was trying to make sure what precisely the problem was, whether yeah. I'm following the code or just that at a certain point that was designed. Okay, well, people should have gotten something that looked like this. Did the people who got it to run have that something that looked like that, more or less? Um, now that it's debugged, I can get results if I let it run into 250 steps. That might take like five minutes. So, well, if it's if it's if it's running, let's just let's leave it at that for the moment. And again, I I I'm torn because on the one hand, I don't want people to get stuck. On the other hand, I this is something. This basically this is a repeat of the thing we did last week or two weeks ago. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. And the code is is there online, so you shouldn't you shouldn't have to. I understand if you want to write it yourself, that's great, but you shouldn't have to reinvent it too much. So now um, the next step, and this is uh, more work. Um, if you are if you're using the on the code that's provided, you can just download uh, exercise ten point two uh, part two. If you're doing it by hand, you now need to add the mitosis steppable. And do people remember we went over how to add a step the mito add the mitosis steppable to a simulation? Do you remember how or do you have do you have it from last time? So you you already have division in this in the code, Emma? I have that outline of it, but I haven't debugged it. Okay. It's actually comes without the blog actually. Okay. If you want a screen share, we could look at that together if you want. Pedro, I don't know. If you've got it right if you've got it running, maybe you could show people you want to show people how to add mitosis steppable. Well, I uh I have my simulation. I can show that, yes. Okay. Um, the same simulation I built last time. Um, we'll just make sure it is what we expect. Hold on a sec. Okay, sec. Uh, 
I just want to make sure the screen share is correct. Okay. So, so Pedro, one question. Uh, could you possibly go to, just go to um, Twitter and uh, So you have the mitosis steppable here included. Um, if you were starting with the code like 10.1 and you wanted to add the mitosis step mitosis steppable, boy, yeah, I wish I could move that out of the way. Um, well, why don't we, sh can you show people how to do that? Yeah. So let me go back and Oh yeah, so if I didn't have the mitosis tappables, this wouldn't be here. And my simulation would be without mitosis. Because it doesn't have mitosis, we have these weird uh, giant blue cells. Uh, if we had mitosis, the green cells would be expanding and taking the volume of the blue cells. Now let's add mitosis. So to add mitosis, what I do is, um, sorry, it's a CC3D Python, add steppable down here. I click that then you can create your own stepables, but in this case, we want mitosis stepables, which is a specific one. So we have to select mitosis here. That's all, you click okay. Uh, I guess yeah, one, have... before you, you, you have to give it a name. Yeah. Yes. One thing you might, also point out it's a small thing but under cell call frequency the by default the steppables are called every monte carlo step but if you want them called every five monte carlo steps or every 10 monte carlo steps you can set that in that in that window so for example if you had uh, a graphics output steppable that only needed to be called every 10 or 100 monte carlo steps you could set that there Okay. Okay. And so, so give a name and hit mitosis and okay. When you do that, uh, another class emerges, a mitosis tappables, and in the news in the dot pi in the main Python file, uh, we get the import for these specific stepables. Great. I'll save the two, and they always give this rubbish code in the end here where you switch types. We don't want that. Uh, let me just make sure it's all okay. Uh, I have 50 the threshold, and my cells have 25 volumes vo of volume as default, so that's correct. So it should be the one, the one thing you might want to change is cell list by type, because only the only the uh, proliferating cells should divide. I'm not sure why your necrotic cells are getting bigger rather than smaller. Uh, let me think. Did you set the volume constraint to zero? Did you? No, set I, I just set the lambda volume to zero. Yeah, you want to set lambda volume to be large and target volume to be zero. Or at least, actually, for necrotic cells, at the moment, you're not having them disappear. So you don't you don't have to change anything. Yeah, but yeah, that's true. strange because it was working normally before. Let me...
So when you change the the, necro the necrotic cell type should be equivalent to the quiescent cell type in this simulation. Uh, yes, but it's strange. They should be shrinking because um Yeah, okay. So when I switch to necrotic Yeah, I don't can set do lambda volume to zero. Setting Sam. lambda volume to zero and you now that so you shouldn't don't change target volume yet. Because we haven't the the that's a later stage of the simulation. The moment we're not having our necrotic cells disappear. Okay. There we go. Okay, there we go. That's fine. Let's see them. Yeah, there you go. There you're getting some cell division. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So we may, we may come back to that in a, in a minute. So one thing that you could play with already with this is something that's usually true biologically, which is that after a cell division, the cells become quiescent and that they have to have some positive signal then to become proliferating again. That may or may not make a difference to your simulation. It's something to think about, though. Um, when you when you uh it, because remember that in our simulation the threshold for oxygen for which cells go from proliferating to quiescent is different from the threshold at which you go back from quiescent to proliferating and so if the cells become quiescent immediately after after they've divided you're going to have slightly fewer proliferating cells and so you expect the growth of the tumor to be a little bit slower than it would be otherwise. The next thing that you want to do, and again, you can download this from the online materials uh, if, if you didn't get through that last one, uh, is instead of starting with uh, a large number of cells, start with a single cell, start with a single uh, quiescent cell and see how the simulation changes. And I want to make sure that people are able to get that one to run. Pedro, does that work if you start with a single cell? Let me see. You want to? Do you want to screen share it? Yeah. I was meditating over the code, so I will make the change now. Um, so I will start with radius 10. With 10, hopefully that's only one cell. Let me check that. No. Make radius. Yeah. With. 
Right. Okay, and it already divides because it because the initial volume is. Let me reduce then. So four, five. Let's see. Okay, that's one cell. Okay, let's see what happens. Uh, it could be that the metabolism is the uh, the the basal metabolism is too no. high, Something but is in, so it's no, well, it's 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 green. It's proliferating. Yeah. And it divided, so good. So this is fine. So this is a little bit more interesting than the uh, than the simulation where you start with the bigger tumor, uh, because you could actually see you could actually see a bit of the uh, of the organization. Initially, all the cells are getting enough nutrient, so they're all proliferating. And we should see at a critical size that we begin to get uh, quiescent cells in the center and then uh, eventually necrotic cells. Uh, I was thinking something. Shouldn't we consider the average uh, concentration of the of nutrient? across the cell volume instead of the total amount? Well, you're taking it up. So, right, you're, ta well, I'm not sure how your simulation does it. In, in the simulations that we have, we are, we're taking the nutrient out of the field. And so we are in fact taking the amount, the, the amount available out. So we're doing that. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, but I mean, as the cell in, as the cell increases, it should require more nutrients. Ah, you mean you want to have the the, the resting metabolism to scale with the cell volume? Yes, that's a reasonable that's a reasonable hypothesis. Because I think uh, the reason I have the green cells in the middle is because they are much larger than the others. Yep, that's that's certainly a possibility. Again, this is a very naive simulation, and one of the the reasons it's interesting to work with a simulation like this is to ask exactly that kind of question. Now, in the simulation you have, you've gone a step or two ahead of where we were in the in the exercise because you have the 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 necrotic cells disappearing. Yeah, I can reset. And so. Uh, In that case, you get the spatial patterning, the reaction diffusion pattern. And again, people are people are welcome to work uh, to work on their own code, but I think it's it's interesting to see how this works when you have it have it running. Making this a realistic model of a tumor, it is certainly work, and it requires thinking more carefully about the biology. Computationally, it's not really very much more work. It's more a question of deciding on the parameters and the rules, which is why I think it's a, a worthwhile simulation to do, even if it's not terribly realistic uh, at this stage. You'll notice here that even though all the cells are green, the ones in the center are growing very slowly because they're close to the resting metabolism. And now, of course, you see the red cells coming in. And now you're getting that necrotic core. But did anybody else run the run the demo and get something similar? William, you were able to get that. You were able to get that, right. Emma, were you able to get this to 
to work or? No, I'm looking at the activity monitor on my computer, trying to figure out what's going on. I think there's something strange going on with how slow it is. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that that's frustrating. I, I I know it's no fun to have to have that not not work for you. How about Kyle? Were you able to get that to download? Almost got it in the right fault. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Does CC3D accumulate objects like stored in the random access memory? No. No, it's not doesn't have a lot of memory leaks. It's pretty good that way. And I, I'm I'm puzzled, Emma, because I've never I've never seen that on any other computer. Really? No. If if I had, I would maybe have some fixes for you, but but I want to understand why it is and I should be able to see what's going on in the activity monitor. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this this simulation that we're doing here ran in real time, you no, know, twelve years ago on computers of that era. So I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's like a computing problem per se. Other than yeah. my particular, machine. yeah. But I have no clue what it could possibly be. I mean, the only other thing I can think of is that maybe CompuCell. If you have very limited mem RAM, maybe the the default amount of RAM that CompuCell is asking for is too much, and so it's swapping. So I think it might be, yeah, some problem with the. And so then you could tell it to ask for less RAM, assign less memory to it, because you're not using very much in the simulation. The simulation is pretty small, but I I'm not sure. Something that one, if you've got this running in, in, this, in the demo online, you'll get a plot of the number of proliferating quiescent and necrotic cells as a function of time. And so you could see how the, the simulation evolves that way. Um, the, only th the, the next step, and it's the one that Pedro already showed us, is to have the necrotic cells uh, shrink and disappear and the easiest way to do that is to have their target volume decrease by one voxel per monte carlo step uh, maybe a little bit less uh, and uh, in that case you're going to get and i think given the time i'm not going to i'm not going to have you do this exercise here again it was a homework exercise for people um, if you do that you find that the pattern becomes much more interesting um, as we saw with Pedro, uh, you get a, a, a round tumor growing with the basic simulation. When you start having the necrotic cells disappear, shrink and disappear, then the tumor becomes spatially unstable. And depending on the exact rules you use for the growth and the disappearance, uh, you could get something that looks like... Uh, essentially a four-pointed uh, domain like this, or if you run it for a long time, you could get uh, the tuber splitting into multiple subcomponents, multiple blobs. And if you ran the simulation on a much bigger lattice with a lot more cells, you could get reasonably complex uh, morphologies, branched or fingered morphologies. And this is something that is... Uh, typically associated with tuber progression, uh, where you get uh, where you get uh, invasive phenotypes. There there are multiple reasons that cancers metastasize. One of the things that happens in metastasis, which of course is not in a model like this, is that the tuber cells have to be able to avoid being killed by the immune system. Another aspect of metastasis is that the intrinsic motility of the cells may increase, which is also not in the simulation. A third one is that the cell-cell adhesivity within the tumor may go down, and the cell matrix adhesivity may go up, which makes it easier for the cells to separate from their parent tumor and join uh, and invade the surrounding space. 
And the last one, which is what you're seeing here, which is called the diffusion limited growth, is that the availability of nutrient it depends on position. In particular, if you have a region of surface here that's sticking out from the mean radius of the tumor, that point will have a higher availability of nutrient and therefore it'll grow faster. And if you have a dip like this, it's basically shadowed. And so it's going to have a, a lower level of nutrient. So it's going to grow slower. And so this circle has an intrinsic instability where points on the circle that stochastically get a little bit ahead grow faster and go further ahead and points on the circle that go behind stochastically get even further behind. In this case, the reason you're seeing the square is that we have the nutrient coming in from the edges of the domain and the domain itself is square and so there's a little bit more nutrient in the corners than there is along the middle of the sides, which is not biologically realistic. We really, if we were going to do the simulation really more accurately, we would either put in uh, explicit sources of nutrient with spots that represented blood vessels, or we could draw a circle, uh, which was a source of nutrient, so that there was a circular source of nutrient rather than one on the boundaries of the lattice. Another one, which is not an unreasonable one to do, which is an exercise in the stretch exercises and in the homework, is to assume that the medium itself is a source of nutrient, uh, which is not unreasonable for cells in, in a highly vascularized stromal tissue. Uh, and in that case, uh, you'll also get different patterns. Again, the point here is that you could get a whole variety of interesting uh, spatial structures, uh, even with a very simplified uh, model of, of the tumor. Okay. And so I'd like to move on now, uh, let people explore those simulations and the Homer problems more. I wanted to make sure everybody could run them and... Uh, and had them working. Now, what I would like to talk about for the rest of the class is how cells move in response to gradients in their environment. At the moment, we've had cells move randomly, random cell motility, and we've had cells uh, move because they're sticking to other cells. And we've had move, cells move because there's proliferation of other cells that's pushing their neighbors around, or death of cells and adhesion moving cells around. Uh, but cells in particular can respond to external signals in the environment by moving. And the general name for that is taxis, T-A-X-I-S. Uh, and there are many different ways that cells can respond and measure, respond to the environment features in their environment. Um, they can move in response to the rigidity of the extracellular environment. Uh, in particular, in general, cells move faster on more rigid substrates uh, up to a point. If the cell sub substrates are too rigid, they tend not to like it. But in general, cells move faster on more rigid substrates. They don't like soft substrates. Uh, cells definitely can sense and respond to chemical uh, to electrical fields. So for example, in wound healing, you get ionic gradients and electrical gradients around the wound that uh, promote uh, in migration of fibroblasts and macrophages to the wound. Of course, uh, gravity acts on cells, typically on the scale of individual cells in a tissue. Uh, gravitational forces are quite small. But if we were simulating larger objects, gravity might be important. And there are definitely some biological processes, uh, even within cells, that can be influenced by gravity, even though it's quite weak. Uh, there are many situations in which cells uh, move in response to temperature gradients, uh, either moving towards warmer temperatures, towards cooler temperatures, or towards some optimal temperature. Uh, bacteria, in particular, uh, have a tendency to migrate towards uh, optimal temperatures. Uh, they also can, uh, some cells especially get bacteria in single-celled eukaryotes, 
uh, but also, of course, multicelled organisms, uh, which could be modeled as agents, uh, often respond to light. They either move towards brighter light or away from light. They could respond to the uh, acidity of the environment, the pH. Uh, they can sense a fluid flow and move in response to the flow. Uh, they can respond to stresses and strain in the environment. That's sort of a specialized form of neurotaxis. Uh, but in particular, after that long list of things we're not going to be modeling, uh, they can move in response to chemical concentrations, especially of nutrients, oxygens, toxins, and signaling molecules. And so uh, typically you will find that not, not all cells respond in this way, uh, but many cells will move towards uh, sources of nutrient uh, or oxygen uh, away from things that are toxic to them. Uh, and uh, especially things like the immune, immune cells will migrate uh, actively in response to uh, cytokines, to immune signals. And a lot of uh, embryonic cells and, and uh, will, will migrate in response to uh, growth factors, gradients of growth factors. And there are all sorts of movies one can play uh, showing, uh, showing uh, migration. Uh, this is uh, a movie of uh, aggregate of uh, Dictyostelium discoidium. Uh, here you see individual Dictyostelium discoidium migrating on a substrate. Uh, when they starve, uh, they begin to send out a signal called cyclic AMP. They move up gradients of cyclic AMP, uh, and then they form aggregates. And that that movie perhaps is, uh, maybe this one on the right is actually a better one. In this movie, you have a micropipette. Uh, these are the kinds of pipettes that are typically used uh, in neuroscience experiments, which is secreting a little bit of cyclic AMP at the end. And these dictyostelium, these dictyostelium cells are then moving towards that source of cyclic AMP. And so you see, you can't actually see the gradient, but here we know the gradient is there because uh, the the cell, the the the, it's, the chemical is being put into the environment by the by the pipette. At a macroscopic level, this gives rise to these incredible uh, famous spiral patterns. Uh, during the aggregation phase of Dicti. Uh, that's a simulation that's been done with, uh, with modeling methodologies that are comparable to CompuCell. Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful simulation to run, but it's a pretty expensive one, and so uh, it's not one that we're going to do in class. Uh, there is a, a Dicti model in the demos folder that's a sort of a uh, oversimplified version of this that you could play with. Uh, but in order to get these big spirals that you're seeing here, you need hundreds of thousands or millions of cells. And so that makes that an expensive simulation. You can get pieces of it, though, uh, pretty easily. But the basic idea here is that you have a chemical in the environment, the grit, and the cells move towards... Uh, sources of the chemical. Now, in reality, the way cells sense and respond to chemical gradients is rather complicated. There are receptors on the surface of the cell that receive the chemical signal. Those receptors, in turn, promote either polarization and polymerization of uh, actin within the cell or depolymerization of actin. And that leads to the migration of the cell in a particular direction. From the point of view of, of almost all modeling, we're going to assume that the chemical field effectively applies a force to the cell, uh, which is we're going to model the, the speed of the cell in response to the chemical field and not how that movement is generated mechanistically. Uh, if we want to model the, the active treadmilling inside of the cell and the way it's, it's modulated, that's a pretty complicated simulation. 
Uh, Pedro, uh, with Gilberto, and others have quite a nice uh, simulation of a single migrating cell uh, that has a simplified version of a, of a more micro model of this. Uh, but to begin with, our chemical uh, response model is going to assume that, uh, to begin with, that the force is effectively exerted by the chemical concentration and that the local force on the cell membrane is proportional to the field gradient. Uh, that is that the force at the cell membrane is uh, minus a lambda chemo uh, times the gradient of the chemical concentration. Uh, if you're a chemist, you'll recognize what that means in terms of energies. That means that the chemical uh, field is behaving like a chemical potential. Uh, if you're not a chemist and chemical potentials don't mean anything, you don't need to think about that. But the naive version of chemotaxis, which is the interaction between a field and a cell in CompuCell, assumes that the force of the cell is linearly proportional to the gradient of the concentration. Now, that will have the cells move up and, up and down chemical concentrations in the direction you want, uh, the cell will move towards a higher concentration if it's got positive chemotaxis towards the chemical. Um, move away from lower concentrations. Uh, but it also has some perverse effects which don't happen in the biological situation. Uh, if the gradient becomes very steep, the cell will move very fast. It'll fall apart or disappear even because the force could be very large. Um, the cell as it moves, doesn't change the concentration of the chemical. In reality, when the cell moves, it's going to going to displace the fluid around it, and that'll change the chemical concentration if the chemical's carried in the in the liquid around the cell. If the chemical is carried to substrate that the cell's moving on top of, then that's not an issue. And uh, there also is no assumption that the cell sensing the chemical is using it up. In reality, the chemical binds to receptors on the cell membrane, and at least some of the time that chemical is then broken down by that binding, in which case the the uh, the concentration decreases a little bit. The other basic assumption we're making here is that the response of the cell is constant in time uh, to the chemical, and that's not always the case. Uh, in the dictyostelium case, the cells move uh, in response to the external chemical uh, for some period of time, then they stop moving uh, for some period of time, then they start moving again. So they have cyclic uh, movement. Uh, however, if we make the reason we use this very simple form is, as I say, that then the chemical uh, effective uh, energy associated with the chemical field is, has a particularly simple form. The uh, Chemotactic energy is the sum over all the cells that are chemotaxing, uh, plus the sum over all of the voxels inside the cell uh, times the strength of the chemical response times the local chemical concentration. And if lambda chemo is less than zero, you have chemo repulsion, you move away from higher concentrations. If lambda chemo is greater than zero, you have chemo attraction. In principle, the same cell could respond to multiple chemicals in its environment. It might be attracted to glucose and move away from a toxin. Uh, you could have a chemical, uh, you could have a field that represented something like temperature or light intensity, and you could have the cell attracted or, or repelled by that. In the case of bacteria, there are actually mechanical ways that the cells integrate signals uh, from attractants and, and repellents to decide what to do. Um, CC3D actually offers some other kinds of chemotaxis uh, forms, um, and uh, we'll come back to that in a bit. Usually, we're going to use something called logarithmic chemotaxis, uh, which is a little bit more biologically realistic, but conceptually, it's a little bit more complicated, so I want to start with a simple one. So if you want to specify chemotaxis in CompuCell, uh, as usual, uh, we have it in the wizard. Uh, 
the Kiva Taxis uh, is a plugin, uh, so it goes in the XML. Uh, we're often going to make the Kiva Taxis vary cell by cell, in which case we're going to be using Python for part of the specification. But as usual, we'll have to tell the simulation that we're using Kiva Taxis. And so there's a plugin called Kiva Taxis. And if we're going to specify things in the XML, we have to say which chemical field the cells are responding to and which types of cells are doing the responding. So we have chemical field, a source, because the field could be processed by different diffusion solvers, and the name of the field. And then Kiva Taxis by type, type equals amoeba, in this case, some cell type we've defined. Uh, the strength of the chemotactic response, setting lambda equals zero is a little bit silly because there's no, not going to do anything. And then uh, chemotactic towards, uh, we're allowed to have the cells respond differently depending on what they're touching. And this is representing biological reality. Uh, if a cell is contacting extracellular matrix, it may move in one way. If it's contacting a fluid medium, it may move in another way. If it's contacting other cells of particular types, it may move in yet a third way. And so that we can have the cell behavior depend on, of each surface of the cell depend on what the contact is. And so our next exercise, and now this is one where I really do want people to do it, uh, you could use wizard. Actually, all the things that you're going to do are in wizard. Uh, our create a simulation, uh, you can make it a 200 by 100 by one lattice uh, with periodic boundary conditions if you want. Uh, and then we want to create a single cell, just one cell. Uh, we'll call, we'll add a chemical field, we could call it oxygen. Uh, with diffusion solver Fe, and we're going to have uh, contact energy, uh, volume, and uh, chemotaxis. And in the chemotaxis plugin, you can make the lambda chemo to be 500. Uh, in the CC3DML, uh, create a linear gradient. Uh, so in that case, you probably don't want the uh, chemotaxis plugin to have periodic boundary conditions. Uh, and you probably want the initial concentration to be the same as the final concentration. Uh, put the cell initially to the right-hand side of, well, I said right, but probably left-hand side of the lattice. If you're going to have a higher concentration on the right, put the cell on the left. Uh, and then plot the position of the center of mass of the cell in the x-direction as a function of time. And run the simulation for different values of lambda. Uh, the assignment is, what is the speed of the cell as you change lambda chemo? Okay. Do people think that they, do people want to try that? Do people want to see me do it in front of them and then try it? How do you want to do this going forward? It depends a little bit, or maybe we could have, I don't know, Alex, somebody, some, one of you do the, do the demo coding. Do you want to try it first and then see somebody do it? Or would you like to have somebody walk through it first and then and then uh, try it yourself? Emma, what do you think? I'm almost done with checking my desk. Then I'll just do this. Okay. I'm fine with programming. William? I think it would be better for me to give him run. Thank you. Okay. Pedro, do you want to do it? Or Alex? Or... You're okay oh, with it? It's okay. I can do it. Okay. Uh, well, the only thing is that if we do it, hmm, can people screenshot the assignment before we do that? Yeah, I, I just did it. I was, <laughs> I had the exact problem on mine. So why don't people screenshot the assignment? And then you can have that on your on your to refer to as we as we go through it. Okay. I mean, I'm happy to code it my code it myself, but I think it's it's probably more useful to have one of you do it. Walk through it.
Okay. Does everybody have that screenshotted? Yes, no. Okay. Okay, Pedro. Let's just use wizard to do that. All right. Uh, 200 by 100 by one. So, so why don't we just start a new, new project? Yeah. So we'll go to wizard, it's new CC3D project, call it Chemotaxis. Okay. 200 by 100. Why don't we slow down? People, why don't you try to follow along? Why don't we actually try to do this together? William, can you? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So 200 by 100. And we said periodic boundary conditions, although you're not really going to care about that. Yeah, for the, for the, okay. at least in Y, you want them to be periodic. And we'll use blob initializer to start with. And it's okay. There we go. Okay, everybody got that? Okay. Next. And now we just need one cell type. We can call it cell. Okay. Next. William, is that okay? Yeah. Okay, now we need a chemical field. And... Uh, Pedro is calling it oxy. You can call it oxygen or glucose or whatever you want. Okay. Everybody ready for that? Santu, are you able to follow? Uh, yes, I could follow. Okay. Good. Okay. Next. And now we're going to have contact, volume, hematoxis. Okay, that's it. Next. And now we have to specify the Kibitaxis plugin, which is we have to say which cell type is cell. So that's okay. We need to give the value of lambda. And I said 500 here. And that's, we need to hit add entry. Okay, and that should be it. Next. Finish. Everybody got that? Okay. Okay. Why don't you try running that and see what happens? It's not going to do what you want. You're going to have to make some changes to the to the simulation. Uh, let's see. Let's try again. Let's run it again first to see what what happens when you run it. First, we have cells that are disappearing. Uh, why don't we display the chemical concentration too? And the chemical isn't do, isn't a gradient from left to right either. It's coming from the top. So uh, now we can go back and and try to do the various things that we need to do. Uh, let's look at the XML first. We're going to need to make lambda volume bigger so the cell doesn't disappear on us. What's the target volume? That's fine. Okay. So now at least our cells aren't disappearing. Well, they are. Let's see what happened. Uh, hmm. All right. Okay, let's just keep going through your code. And we wanted one cell to begin with. So we'll make the radius in the blob initializer. Okay, 10 and 10, it should be all right. Let's try that. 
Okay. Well, certainly got a cell that's moving around. So that's a good, good start. But the chemical concentration isn't what, what, what we want. Okay. And so now we're going to have to play with it. Well, we're going to have to make the chemical concentration what we want. And that takes a little bit more editing. We want uh, periodic boundary conditions in the y direction. Uh, that's that's x in the y direction. So periodic and y. Okay, now try running it. And let's look at the field. So now we have chemical coming in from the edges, but we want chemical coming in only from the right and not from the left. And so we want to make the boundary condition. Uh, 10 is fine on the, well, zero on the yeah, min, 10 on the max. That would be good. Okay. Oh, the cell's behaving strangely because it's secreting a chemical itself. That's why it's doing something interesting. So we probably have to turn off the secretion by the cell. Wasn't called for. Okay. And we don't want any decay. We don't want any chemical decay in this simulation. So we want the global decay coefficient to be zero. And we need to get rid of, yeah, okay, fine. There we go. And we probably want the diffusion constant to be bigger. Yeah. And we can get rid of 71 and 72 because we're not doing anything inside the cell or make them the same as make them the same as the field. Try that. Okay. So now we see the chemical moving, and we see the cell moving up the gradient of the chemical. And it's a little hard to see it because of the color scan. And there were only two more things in that list of suggestions that we had. One of them was to make the cell start out at a small value of x instead of in the middle. So in our block, in our uniform initializer, put our center to say x equals 20. Yeah, there we go. That looks good. Good. And you'll notice that until the chemical gets there, the cell doesn't really move. Now it'll start accelerating. And so the other thing we, su we suggested was that we use, we have the chemical start out with the final concentration. And so to do that, we can look at the initial concentration there and we want it to be 10 we want it to be zero when x is equal to 10 zero and we want it to be 10 when x is equal to 200 so x times 10 times x divided by 200 will give us that and so now you'll see the cell move with a uniform rate
And the last thing you might want to do is plot the exposition as a function of time of the cell. So that we have to do in our Python. We go to the, init, the start function and we pull down scientific plot. And we're going to create a plot window. And we'll say, we probably name the title position or so, exposition or something like that. And also in line 15, probably. Yeah, if you want to plot Y position too, you can. Doesn't do anything. Okay. Try to get rid of line 21. Okay, and then for the cell, we want to plot its position. So we add a data point. I don't think you want to erase it. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, OK. And we have to remember what XCOM is the center of mass. If you don't remember that, it's in the pull down cell attributes list. OK. OK, let's try that. And you'll see the cell moves at a constant speed. Okay. So that was probably a little bit fast for the edits. Can let's come back to the let's come back to the uh, instructions. Pedro, maybe we'll leave your 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 you you with the screen share. But why don't we pull the pull the the instructions back up? Okay. Now, why don't people spend, do you think people, do people think that they can try to reproduce that? You've seen it rather quickly. Uh, why don't you try working on that and see if you can come back to that uh, on your own for the moment. Okay. If there's any of that that you want to go over again, uh, please feel free to ask, but I think all of the instructions, that, all the things that we changed are listed here in the, uh, in the instructions. So why don't people take a few minutes and try to get that to work? Does everybody have the basic simulation where you have a cell that responds to the chemical field? Is that not working? For, okay. okay. So now the problem is that the defaults that, 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 that wizard gives you aren't exactly the things you need. So you have to go through each of the, each of the components of the simulation and tweak it. And I thought Pedro did a nice job there of going through step by step and showing how the simulation changed as you changed each thing one at a time. And I strongly recommend for people as you develop simulations to do exactly that, change one thing, save it, run it, try again. So, so once you have, once you've used wizard, it will give you a simulation that will run, but the chemical field will not be the field you need. And so, what we have to do is edit the details of the chemical field to match the thing that we want, and then also add the add the uh, plot. So, if if you've got it working, try changing the value of lambda chemo 
and see how the speed of the cell movement changes with lambda chemo. Emma asks a great question, which is, the boundary conditions of the lattice are periodic, but the cell goes to one end and stops. So you have periodic boundary conditions for the cell, but not for the field. Now, it's, it may seem a little bit perverse to have different boundary conditions for the cell and the, and the chemical field. But if you use periodic boundary conditions for the chemical concentration, then the chemical will leak around the edge. So it's just happened directly up the gradient. Right. Is it possible to set it to switch from going up the gradient to down the gradient? Or yes. So Emma asked, could you set it so that you switch from going up the gradient to down the gradient? And we'll do that. We'll do that in a few minutes. Uh, if you want to do it by hand, go into the model editor and player and change the sign of the lambda chemo from plus 500 to minus 500. Why don't you try that? There he goes. Back the other way. So, so. If we have access to the lambda chemo in, in Python, which we'll do in a few minutes, then what we could do is we could say, for example, if the center of mass of the cell is less than 10, flip the direction. If the center of mass of the cell is more between fourth is, is 180, flip the direction. And then you can have the cell play ping pong with the cell. And actually, I'll, I'll give you a demo code which does exactly that. So, what it does is it it sets the it sets the chemical the lambda chemo to be positive. The cell crawls up the gradient. When it gets to the end, it sets the chem lambda chemo to be negative, and the cell comes back. But it changes the value of lambda each time. It measures how fast the cell moved, and then it plots the speed versus lambda. So that's a way of doing a parameter scan so you could see how fast the cell moves as a function of lambda. It might be more elegant to call the simulation many times with different values of lambda, but in some ways it's simpler to do it inside of one simulation. And that was running fast enough for you, that Emma, that it was it was manageable. This one is quite fast. It's the other one. Maybe it's some for loop that my computer is doing forever on. Or... Might be the plotting. I tried to comment out the plotting though, and that didn't happen. Yeah, well, sometimes if the plotting is slow, you could have it update the screen every ten Monte Carlo steps instead of every Monte Carlo step. Well, it was already doing it. Okay, in that case, then I really, I'm sorry. I wish I could help you on that. I'm so okay. Santoshi, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay, do you have it working? Um. I mean, why don't, I... You, why don't you show what you have? Why don't you open it in player? Okay. The simulation is 200 by 100. That's fine. Uh, boundary conditions are periodic. You have one cell type. Uh, cell has a lambda volume of two. That may need to be changed, but that's okay. Uh, let's look at contact energy. You only have one cell type. That's fine. Keep going. Um, you don't have the chemotaxis plug-in defined? Oh, uh, I... Did you follow the instructions? Yeah. It, no. So, it is, this is... I, I just restarted it again, so let me just do it and check. No, just, just don't, don't, don't. So if you go, go to... So you're going to have to reload the Cubitaxis plugin. So put your cursor at line 51. Go to CC3DML. Plugins. Cubitaxis. Comment out and add. OK. So you're going to need to get rid of uh, all but the first of those lines.
you didn't do that. You didn't you, you didn't eliminate those other ones. No, no. Put it back the way it was. What are you trying? Tell me what you're trying to do. Uh, I'm just trying to clear this. What What are you trying to do? Um. You need to have a constant a chemotaxis for a single cell type with a constant lambda chemo. Uh, just try to add it again. Okay. Why don't you erase all of that chemotaxis and just start from the beginning? So you have to get rid of end plug in too. You have to clear that line completely. Yes, that's fine. Okay. Lambda should be 500. What is the cell type? Where it says type, you need to give the name of the cell type. Under type? No. You're not using chemotac toward, so get rid of that. So, so one thing, Santoshi, you might want to think about is there are manuals online, so you can look at those. If you're confused, you could look up chemotaxis in the manuals and see how to do this. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. So what is the cell type that you created? What kind of, what is the name of the cell? Um, what is the name of the cell? Um, like, I did not give it any names. What is the name of the cell type? Look at line 26. What is the name of the cell type? Uh, the medium. No, medium is not a cell. Why don't you look at line 30? What is, read line 30. Um. Yeah, volume, energy, parameters, cell type, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now look at your, now look at your uh, chemotaxis plugin. What is cell type? Uh, Read line 57. Yeah, chemotaxis by type, lambda 500. Keep Tag reading. Chemotaxing type. Right. So what do you need to replace chemotaxing type with? Uh, the cell. That's right. Fine. Okay, and you need in line 56 to put the chemical field name. What is the name of the chemical field? Um... Look at line 65. Uh, nutrient. Okay. Run it. Save it first and then run. Uh. No, don't use that button. Always use the other button, the button on the right. 
No, not save as, save all. There. What did you do? Uh, I just clicked on save all. No, you deleted something. Did you switch to a different window? Um, no. You have two versions of Twitter open. Uh, that's the previous one. Well, so you'll have to you you closed your you closed your document, so you have to reopen the simulation. Um, I have like the Zoom thing blocking it, so can I just stop sharing it for a minute and then? Do no, please please open the sim open reopen the simulation. There we go. Select you call it self constructed gradient. Call it self select self constructed gradient. No, it's not a download. No, uh, you were you were already there. Double click on the CC three D font. Open it. Open that. Go back to the XML. Scroll down. Okay. Now in the diffuse, okay, run this. Where's your Python? Okay. There you go. Why don't you show the chemical field? No, the chemical field on the right, where it says cell field, pull that down. Okay. Okay, you have to hit run again. Is that a gradient of a chemical? Um, no, so you're going to have to change the specification of the chemical field. So let's look at the, let's look at your XML. Okay, you called it nutrient. What was it the global diffusion constant was supposed to be from the instructions? Um, Did you screenshot the instructions? Um, no, I did not. Oh. Uh, okay, make it one in line 68. And you're supposed to make the initial concentration zero on the left and 10 on the right. So you want to type X times in line 71 for initial concentration, type X times 10 times 10 and divided by 200. and get rid of the one, because that doesn't mean anything. And you're not allowed to have spaces divided by 200. OK, you don't need line 73 and 74, so delete them. And you need constant value boundary conditions on the x-axis for min and max. You can copy line 87, copy line, sorry, 86, uncomment it, and move it up to line 78. Uncomment. Do you remember how to use uncomment? Go to edit, go to edit, edit. Uh -huh. Edit at the top. Uh, it's blocking. Go to, to edit. Okay, then just hand on comment that one. Okay, no, you need the you you need the 
you need the okay there we go and at the end you have to get rid of that okay you need to comment cop get rid of line 80 okay well line line 80 you need to make a constant value You can't have, you can only have one specification for the, the, the foundry conditions. So you want constant value, max, not min, max of 10. Min, you want zero. Constant value, not constant derivative. and get rid of the periodic boundary conditions in line 79. Okay. Hit save and now run it. No, don't use that one. Use that one. Now hit run. Okay, run it. Okay, you've got it working. That's great. Okay, good. Does anybody else need to help with that, or does everybody have, else have it working? I have my little guy going back and forth. Great. Do you want to show that? Okay, let me log into the Zoom. Me. Let me just let me while you're getting ready. Let me just go on for one more minute and then okay, great. Thank you, thank you, Santoshi, for walking through that. Okay, so uh, in this case, I had the the direction reversed. I had the high concentration on the left and the low on the right. But you should get something that looks like that. Again, this is walking through all the steps. We set cubitaxis by type, lambda equals 500, cell type equal, type equals cell. That's what we just did with Santoshi. Uh, we plotted uh, in the Python, we added, and Santoshi, you could do this. You could follow this step. We're going to create a plot window in the Python start function uh, to plot the position versus time. And then we're going to plot uh, for the cell, we're going to plot the position uh, MCS cell XCOM versus time. And you'll see something that looks like this. And depending on how strong the chemical gradient is and the, con and the lambda chemo, uh, that position could be steeper or shallower versus time. Okay. So, uh, did you, were you able, Emma? Did you want to show what you got? Okay. So one one thing that I one of the demos that actually I, I provided to you, although not not uh, it's not in the exercises, it is in the homework. Um, is to uh, in this case the cell will go to the end and then stop, uh, but you could have the lambda chemo reverse. Uh, when the cell gets to the end, I'd go back and forth. And in that case, you could even do something else, which is you could, each time you reverse it, you could measure the speed of the cell, and then you could change the value of lambda chemo by, say, multiplied by point, 1.1, 1. 1, and then plot lambda chemo versus the speed. And so then you could actually do a little parameter sweep where you study the speed versus lambda chemo. Okay, so the cell is getting towards the edge. And now it reverses. So to measure the velocity, you could you could take the position at the left or the right. Oops. Oh, you 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 don't have periodic boundary conditions in the of the of the top and the bottom. That's why we use periodic boundary conditions for the cell lattice, so you don't get stuck on the wall. I know. Well, I realized that I made it 200 by 200, and then I switched it to 100, but that was probably... But why is it so periodic? 
says periodic. Well, I, I think he is going over. You see, it's split in half here. Okay, so, so let's let's look at the chemical field then. Something funny about the chemical field. Yeah, maybe something happened. Ah, so, so you have absorbing boundary conditions. So you don't have periodic boundary conditions in Y for your chemical field. Right, so, so yeah, you, it's actually there in line 683. Yeah. yeah. Great, okay, good, there we go. I would need, is the right syntax like this? Another one? Periodic with a, with a, a, and yeah, you need a, that, that should work. But just look at line 82, that's the correct syntax. Like that, that will work. Yes. Why, when I'm next to it, does it flag that as? Oh, it's just because. Okay, I interpreted that as an error, but it's. Okay, try that. There we go. Well, I guess last time when it was two hundred by two hundred, it just wasn't big enough for the falling off of the gradient at the edges. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Great. So do you want to show the code you used to reverse the constant, the direction? Mm -hmm. So the first thing is that playing around, I learned that I still. Oh, um, may I unmute? Here, let me let me. Uh, like yeah, yes, but let me. Let, I have to. I have to turn off the sound on my, on my. Uh, here we go. The first thing I think I learned, although maybe it's not essential to the solution, is that I can't just get rid of this plugin here. I have to include this or else the program will crash. Okay. Um, so you have to keep this, but then in your Python, you have to add to the start function um, these lines of code, which you can get from over here by cell ID define. And that has to be when you're working with cells individually. So that's why it's in this for loop. Um, and then once I have like defined my initial Lambda, oh, by the way, that is up here. I just wanted to make sure I could change the Lambda value easily. Um, in the step function, you can set it up to do the back and forth by, um, basically seeing whether your cell is like at the extreme ends of the X axis. And if it is, and it's not going the right direction, then you, um, switch the lambda to the other sign. That's, that's great. James, you're still muted.
Okay, so let's see. It takes a little while, but you should see that uh, if the that the the it, the the slope gets a little steeper each time you do it. Maybe if we multiplied by two, it would have been it would have been clearer. But I can try that. Yeah. If you really wanted to explore the parameter space, you probably want to do it fairly slowly so you see the steps. But but to do it, but to start, but just as a demo, yeah, there you go. And you'll see if the lambda chemo gets to be too big, it's going to break. It'll the cell will break. Okay. Hmm. Are we sure we saved the new version? You can see uh should be greater than two thousand. No. Yeah, it's the old version somehow. Huh. So so maybe close player and relaunch player. Sorry about that, but it should update automatically with that. So I'm not... Okay. No. Maybe I'm putting it in manually somewhere. Oh, that's here. That's odd. Maybe this isn't working. Well, but it is reversing. So let's see. Why is it not? That's the same now. Oh. Huh. Maybe it's that this isn't updating this field here. Well, it won't. Should it probably won't update in the display. But it's not changing, it's changing, it's interesting, it's changing the sign, but it's not changing the value because you'd see it get steeper. So what what you should what you shouldn't let's let's look at your I I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we, we have I've got slides on it a little bit later. I guess it is maybe getting steeper. I don't know. <laughs> it's um it may be close to the, fa the fastest it can move. There really is a maximum speed limit. So if you push too, if you push hard, this, the fastest a cell can move is one voxel per Monte Carlo step. Okay. And so if you try to push it, let's try to make it smaller. Let's try to divide by two instead of multiplying by two. That one should be that one should be clearer. So zero point five, yeah, there you go. Okay, let's try that. That one should be pretty evident. It may be a long wait to come back if it's working. But uh, if it's not, we will we'll come back to how you set these things in 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 Python in a few minutes. Hmm. Yeah, I think that may be. Let's see if it. Yeah, that that so it is. That's working. You see, the slope of that new one is definitely lower than the other one. Okay, great. Okay, so that works. So the issue, the issue, Emma, was that that, that you, there's a speed limit in CompuCell that if you try, you can't push things faster than one voxel per Monte Carlo step. So that's what was happening there. Thanks, that was great. Good to see that. Okay, I've got to find my cursor now. Okay.
Okay, thank you, Emma. That was I appreciate that. So the next one that we're going to try is something called self-constructed gradient. And again, there's a demo for it. And this one actually represents a, a sort of a fun result that uh, gives you some rather interesting dynamics. And uh, the 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 forward the forward chemical gradient that we have here, we in the first case we imposed a chemical gradient, and the cell moved in response to it. And Emma showed us that we could change lambda chemo, and have the cell respond differently to the same chemical. So we could have it go up and then down again, which is what ants do, for example, when they when they're full, they 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 go one direction in the chemical gradient, and when they're empty, they're they go the other way. Bacteria sometimes will do the same thing. Um, but the chemical field was fixed. In a self-constructed gradient, we're going to imagine the following scenario. Suppose that we are an amoeba and we're eating a chemical in our environment, like glucose. And we want to keep going to places where there are higher concentrations of glucose. So a rule would be that we move up gradients of glucose. But when we are in a given place, we're eating the glucose that's in that place, which is reducing the concentration in that place. And so the result of this is that we are, built, we are digging a hole and then climbing out of the hole continuously. And the result of that is actually a search mechanism where our cell will explore space and eat all of the chemical everywhere uh, automatically. Now it'll miss some, it'll miss some spots. But is it clear what the mechanism is? I want the I suppose the environment starts out with glucose everywhere. And suppose the glucose doesn't diffuse, suppose it's just fixed in space. And now I eat the glucose where I am, and I move to a place. I look around, I say, oh, there's glucose over there. I move there. And then I eat it there. Well, now I'm out of it, and I look around me, and I find it in my neighborhood, and I keep moving. Um, this could give rise to what's called persistent movement. Once the cell starts, initially the cell moves in a random direction, but once it starts moving, behind me, the concentration is low. Ahead of me, the concentration is high, so I keep moving in the same direction. Um, this kind of persistent movement actually does occur quite a bit in biology, especially in early development. So in uh, embryonic uh, neural crest cells migrated this way. They create a track that they then follow. And uh, vascular endothelial cells also move to some extent in this way. And there's a great set of experiments by uh, Paul Kulesa uh, in zebrafish showing that this is what happens with uh, neural crest cells. And also uh, there are simulations using a different methodology, but the same basic idea uh, by Philip Beatty and his collaborators at Oxford University. And so actually this mechanism is something that's currently a topic of research. In other words, Philip and Paul are publishing papers at, up, up to today uh, on this mechanism. So it's actually a, quite an interesting mechanism. So um, here we're going to start, we could use the same simulation that we started with just now, but and you don't have to make it 100 by 200. You could leave it 100 by 200, whatever side you ha size you had. And you don't have to change the names of your fields. You could leave the ones to be the ones you had, uh, if you like. But this time we do need uh, a global uh, diffusion coefficient, decay coefficient to be zero, uh, at least to begin with. But we need the cell-specific diffusion coefficient to be 0 0.001 and the decay coefficient to be 0 0.01. And now we want to switch before we had fixed boundary conditions on the left and the right and periodic on the top and the bottom. 
Now we want periodic at both X and Y. And we want the initial concentration not to be a gradient, although it's interesting to do this with a gradient, a weak gradient, because when you have a weak gradient, you can actually get rectification of noise, which is observed biologically. But start with initial concentration of one everywhere. And let lambda chemo be 200. And run the simulation and see what happens. So you don't have to change very much. Here, I've proposed different names for the field of the cell, but you could use the ones you had before. The only thing you have to do is change the diffusion decay coefficients of the cell and the value of lambda chemo. If you start with 500, you'll see what happens. It's not the end of the world. So really, the only thing you have to do is to change the diffusion and decay coefficients uh, of the la of the chemical field, the initial concentration of the chemical field, um, and the boundary conditions. Okay. People want to try that. Is that clear, or do, do people need uh, people want to to go over that? We're following essentially the same workflow as before, which is walk through that diffusion solver and update the parts of the diffusion solver to agree with what's on the screen. William, did you get that to work? I mean, this one? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it just like a little change to the previous one? Yes. Yeah. The results were going to be very different, though. So I want I want you to do, try this and tell me what you got. Emma, were you able to get it? Did it do something funny? Um, didn't do something I didn't expect, so it did what I expected. Do you want to show us? Okay. Well, wait. It's about to interact with its own path. Ah, uh, that's when it gets interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'll show. Okay. So... You get what's called a self-avoiding random walk. And you'll notice it's not a pure random walk because once the cell starts moving in a given direction, it tends to keep going for some amount of time. Uh, and that per, that's called the persistence time. And as you change the uh, percentage of the chemical that you take up and the diffusion constant and also the... Uh, lambda chemo, you can get more crumpled up patterns, more self-avoidant patterns. Uh, yep, that's it. Another one, maybe Emma, you could try. Start with two cells that are fairly far apart. So I need two blob initializers. You could do that, yeah. Just, just copy region and put it twice, yeah. And um, do I need to do anything else? No. We have the same type. Yep. You're not sharing your screen. Go back. There. Okay.
And so let's see what happens if they try. We have to wait a little while, but let's see what happens if they get close to each other. In the meantime, people should try to work on this for themselves. Like watching bugs. Oh, so it's been a case for a long time. No. <laughs> Well, there, there are a remarkable number of biological organisms that actually behave like this. Now, now, I said it's a self-avoiding random walk, but you see that one wandered into a, a trap. Uh -huh. And so if it's it's not so self-avoiding that if it gets stuck, if it gets really trapped, it'll cross it'll cross itself. It it prefers not to, but but it uh <laughs> and you'll notice it's going back and catching all that red, huh? And then when it runs out of red, it's going to wander around a little bit lost until it finds a gradient, and then as soon as it finds it, it'll it'll eat it. I was already thinking about having one secrete and then the other intake and have them chase each other. Yeah, so that's actually, we probably won't get to that exercise today, but the, the classic thing we used to teach as the first one of these is what we call the bacterium macrophage simulation. Oh. And there's a famous, famous movie from the 50s of some red, red blood cells and a, a bacterium and one macrophage. And the, the, the macrophage chases the bacterium around in between the blood vessel in between the red blood cells and then eventually eats it um and so so that's actually a a, a a great exercise to do and so yes if you have if you have one cell secreting and one cell absorbing then then you'll get a chase um and so that's a, that's a, a a fascinating and an interesting uh, simulation in its own right. In this case, you could you could play it. Uh, William, were you able to get this to work? Not like specifically the light, but oh. were you able to get a single cell to do it? Do you want to show us what you have? Oh, I, I'm not in the Zoom zone. So. So so please please do run the zoom when you're in class. Oh, I don't know that. Uh, Santoshi, what about you? Santoshi, are you there? Okay. Alex, how about you? Did you get it to work? Did you try? I had to restart my computer, so I'm a little bit behind. But I'm working on it. Oops, I've got the sound turned off. Try again, Alex. There you go. I'm a little bit behind because I had to restart my computer, but I'm working on it. Okay. If you get stuck, there's a demo with this in it. Uh, but it's a pretty simple simulation because you really... It's only changing about four lines of code from the one we had before. And I can show you a little bit. So if you want to walk through what the code has to look like, you need the chemotaxis plug-in. In this case, we have chemical field name. I called it morphogen, but you could call it whatever you had before oxygen. You don't have to change what you had before. So you actually don't have to change the chemotaxis plug-in. But you do have to change in the diffusion solver. You set the global diffusion constant to zero, global decay constant to zero, Initial concentration to one, and then the diffusion coefficient within the cell to 0 0.001, a decay coefficient in the cell to 0 0.01. Okay. I'll leave that up till everybody can get that typed in. William, do you have that?
Alex, did you get did you get what you need from the screen, or did, should shall I leave it up for a sec? I got what I need. Okay, William. Uh, you can you can add screenshot. Okay. Okay. And then you're going to need to change the the boundary conditions to be periodic on the on the uh, chemical for both X and Y. Now, now, if you're ambitious, this this is, uh, and I wouldn't wouldn't ask that you to do this, certainly not in class. Which is, as I mentioned, this is what's called a persistent self-avoiding random walk. The cell, once the cell starts moving to give a direction, it tends to move in that direction for some amount of time, typical amount of time. And so if you plot the velocity of the cell versus time, you'll see that the velocity will tend to stay the same for a while and then gradually shift. It will gradually, the direction will gradually change. And if you have done, it's not a requirement for the course, but if you've done some, some statistical analysis, one type of statistical analysis you might have looked at is what's called an autocorrelation, which asks the question, how, how fast do things change? And you, you get the autocorrelation essentially by multiplying the current velocity by the velocity of the future time and changing the time interval and seeing how that changes. And if you calculate the autocorrelation, you could calculate the persistence time of the movement. And then you could see how that depends on the parameters in the simulation. If the if the if the if the cell moves just always at a perfectly straight line, then the persistence time would be infinite. If the cell moved like a mosquito where it changed direction every time step with no persistence, then the persistence time would be zero. In this, we can pretty well see that the cell moves maybe a quarter of the size of the lattice before it switches direction. And that'll give us a typical persistence time for the simulation. Were people able to get that to work at this point, William? If you want a screen share, we can help you with that if you like. Kyle, were you ever able to get this CompuCell to work? I, I don't have that. But I'm eager to get into the play. <laughs> So, so Emma, since you, there, there are a lot of games you could play here. You could, you could have one thing you could do is you could have the medium secrete a chemical at a low rate, in which case the chemical comes back, and then the cell can the 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 cell can graze again over the region that it saw before, and so then if you have a cluster of cells. They behave like a herd of buffalo where they'll eat all the grass in one place and they'll move to another place and then the grass grows back and they'll come back to the place they started with. And you can play some even more, more amusing games because you could have the cells have a second chemical where they secrete the chem a chemical that attracts each other. So in that case, you could have uh, the cells really stay as a herd. The cells secrete a chemical which attracts the other cells, chemical type 2, and then they're all eating chemical type 1, 
and following that. And that's actually, I should probably add that as a, Hayden, if you're there, make a note that we should add that as a little homework assignment in the demo. Because that's a very pretty, that's a very pretty simulation. And it really only takes about four more lines compared to what we have. Once you have this. Yeah, I'm here. Could you repeat that quickly, though? I think I heard everything. So, so, so Emma showed what happened if we had two two cells, and the cells move apart from each other because they want to find their own, they want to find their own regions where there's plenty of nutrient. Mm -hmm. So if if you have the cells secrete a second chemical, where they are attracted to each other, where they're attracted by the second chemical then the cells will tend to come together to aggregate, but the cluster will tend to move to find nutrient. And so that, as I say, will behave a little bit like a herd of buffalo, where the buffalo want to stay together, not right next to each other, but close to each other to protect each other. And then when they've eaten all the grass in a given region, they'll all move as a group to another region. Gotcha. You have to run the simulation on a slightly bigger lattice to make that work or use slightly smaller cells. But that's actually quite a nice. One. Okay. William, how's it going? Why don't you screen share it and and um we can look at it together? What? I cannot screen share. Why not? Um, I didn't tell my screen share. You don't need to download anything to screen share. No, no, it's like I couldn't do it. It's always us. Oh, you can't screen share right now because I'm screen sharing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought you meant that you said that your computer couldn't screen share. No, no. Fine. Okay, fine. Because I, I think I need to retype the, the things. I... Well, just run what you have. Why don't look at what you have first? Don't, don't, the, the don't switch I've things around. Done. Leave, leave the code up. Leave okay. the code up. Don't, don't close things. The one thing you should never do ever do is jump around between windows randomly oh never do that never do that okay it always it will never get you a result that you want uh -huh. I, I i know i know the instinct of wanting to do that but resist that instinct okay, okay. so so let's look at this code together so you have let's start at the top let's always start at the top but let's just make sure everything makes sense okay so we have CompuCell, we have our one processor, fine. We have 200 by 100, periodic boundary conditions, fine. We have one cell type called cell. Yeah. Uh, we have volume, that's fine, okay. And now we have contact energy, that's fine. Okay, let's scroll down. And now we have chemotaxis. Yeah, I think I need to retype because I, I shut it down. That's no, that's fine. What you have there is fine. And now we have a diffusion solver. This is the one where we're going to have to change things. Yeah. So the field name you called O2, that's fine. Mm -hmm. We're going to set global diffusion constant to zero. Global decay constant to zero or 0, 0.0. Okay, initial concentration 1.0. Diffusion coefficient, 0 0.001. Decay coefficient, 0 0.01. Okay, secretion data, none. Get rid of secretion data from 75 to, or just make secretion type cell equals zero. C0, okay. And now boundary conditions, we need periodic for both X and Y. This one? Yes. 
and you have to get rid of lines 85 and 86. And you have to finish uncommenting the comment. You've partially uncommented your comment. Okay, and the same thing in lines 90 through, there you go. Okay, try save, hit save, mm -hmm. try running them. Okay, and why don't we see the chemical field? There we go. You have to hit run again once you change the display. You have to keep it. You have to hit run. Oh, crashed on you. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. No, it's running. It's yeah. running. There you go. That's fine. That's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Not that. But, but the grab is kind of different. So. Well, because you're plotting the exposition only. Oh, okay. So the graph isn't really telling you much mm -hmm. for this. That's left over from the old simulation. That's fine. It would probably be better to... Okay. But that's, that's great. Yeah. So what would happen if you wanted to have two cells? Let's make two cells. Just add one more... So to do that, no, not another cell type, just another cell. So to do that, you want to go to the uh, blob initializer. No, scroll down. Zoom. Never change windows. What? Never jump between windows. Okay. <laughs> really, I understand the instinct, but you have to resist that. If you jump between windows, you will never get the thing done. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's like trying to learn how to, I don't know, bi a bicycle. It's a, it, the, once you, once you're used to it, it seems normal, but it's hard to okay, scroll down to the bottom. Keep going. In blob initializer, that's where you create the cell. So where it says region, copy the lines 100 to 106 and paste them in underneath. There. And now move center to someplace else. Instead of x equals 20, make it x equals 50 or 40. 40. That will create a... You don't have to change the y. Okay. That'll create a second cell. Now hit save. Hit save. I see. And now you can open the player. And we should have two cells, which we do. So now, based on that pattern, you can change. You could change the number of cells. You could change. Uh, probably, instead of plotting x versus time, it would be better to plot x versus y, and then the 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 graph on the right would basically have the positions of the cells versus time. This basically look a lot like the thing in the left. Okay. okay. Great. Well, that's good. So you got that. You got that working. It wasn't too bad. Okay. Anybody else need help? Santoshi, what about you? Were you able to get that to work? Santoshi, are you there? No. Okay. Well, there are a lot of games that one can play. We're almost out of time, but I'll I'll walk you through a few exercises that you can do as part of homework or at home. One of which is adding a diffusion constant to the chemical field. At the moment, the chemical background is fixed. The cell's eating the chemical, but it's but the chemical isn't smoothing out its values. And so if you include uh, a little bit of diffusion in the global diffusion constant, um, then the gradients will gradually smooth out. Um, and it'll change the pattern a little bit. Um, if you change the diffusion constant a lot, you'll find that the, the, that the self-avoidance disappears. Uh, if the chemical diffuses very fast, you don't get this. It depends on the diffusion being slow or zero. The other thing that's interesting is to add a small rate of secretion by the medium 
uh, at a global decay rate, you've got to remember that the equilibrium concentration is the secretion rate divided by the decay rate. And you want to make that equal to one. So if you increase S, the secretion rate, you also have to increase the decay global decay rate to match it. And if you do that, then the field recovers after a time one over the decay rate, one over gamma. Uh, and if you play with that, you could have a situation where, uh, in our case, once the chemical, once you've eaten the chemical, it never comes back. Uh, but if you if you include secretion by medium and uh, global decay, then it's more like eating grass. Our buffalo example, where the gr they graze the grass, then they move on to someplace else, and then the grass grows back and they come back. And so you could do that. And so this 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 series of exercises allow you to explore a whole variety of uh, foraging strategies. Uh, which are used by bacteria and single-celled organisms and by multi-celled organisms as well. And so this is really a classic emergent behavior uh, agent-based model. And so it's really, uh, you can get a lot of different, uh, different uh, phenomena out of this very simple simulation. I wanted to come back to the thing Emma showed which is how to change uh, the chemical properties of the cell, uh, the chemotaxis properties of the cell. So you could change the uh, chemotaxis properties of the cell uh, You could re in Python. So if you do uh, CD, it gets a reference to self.chemotaxis plugin, add chemotaxis data, and then cell comma field name, and then set lambda chemotaxis, you could basically repeat the thing that we just did with the XML locally in the Python. And that means that you could change the uh, chemotaxis properties of the cell. So you could have the cells uh, have a, as Emma did, you could have the cells change the direction of the chemotaxis uh, or the value of the chemotaxis as well. And so that's a pretty powerful feature to have. And so we're not going to have time to do that today, uh, but uh, this exercise actually was pretty much the one that Eb already did for us, uh, which is you start with a lambda chemotaxis of 500, and then periodically we make it, in this case, bigger by 1.2. In this case, and it's exactly the exercise Emma did. Every time the cell reaches the edge of the simulation, change the side of lambda chemotaxis so that the cell moves in the other direction. And so that's an exercise that it, I would, we're not going to have time to do in class, but I really strongly recommend that you try that and make sure you could do it yourself. Um, and I'll just show you what the code looks like. Uh, the code is available to you. Um, this is Emma. This is the version of the code that I had uh, when I when I increased the the value a little bit. Uh, and here I plotted the uh, value of lambda versus the 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 speed of the cell. And I wanted to show you this because there's something rather important to notice about the way the cells behave here which is that if lambda chemo is very small, then the cell pretty ha, fluctuates a lot. And you'll notice that the as I increase lambda chemo, you expect the velocity of the cell to increase, but for very small values of lambda chemo, that increase isn't very big. Notice that it's a logarithmic scale on the x-axis. Lambda, on the x-axis and the speed, it's labeled velocity, but it's the speed on the y-axis. And then there's a pretty big range of lambda, a factor of about 30, over which the, the speed is linearly proportional to lambda, which is what you expect. And then if I make lambda too big, if I see 1e plus 4 here, 
you'll notice that the velocity doesn't increase anymore. The velocity is constant. And that's because there's a fundamental speed limit in CompuCell. Because cells move by creating voxels and deleting voxels, and we can only update voxels once per Monte Carlo step, the fastest a cell can possibly move is one voxel per Monte Carlo step, the center of mass. And in fact, uh, because of the way the stochasticity works, you can't get to that speed. The speed limit is actually about 0.25 voxels per Monte Carlo step because you also have some backward movement during the, during the step. And so here you see that there's a region, a big region of parameters in which the cells behave the way you would want them to, which is as I increase the lambda chemo, the cell moves faster. But if I make lambda chemo too big, my cells get run up against a speed limit of the simulation, not of the biology. And if I make lambda too small, the fluctuations dominate and they don't behave the way I want either. And so people often ask, how do I say what's a reasonable value of a parameter? This is a way of checking what's reasonable. And this is really the first example of a parameter scan uh, that I've shown you. Um, and that's a simulation that I encourage you to look at. I would I would strongly encourage you to, to load that simulation. And you can try other parameters. Instead of making the lambda chemo change, you could make the cell size change. Uh, you could use the same kind of code to make it a different, in this simulation, the cell adhesion contact energy doesn't do much. But you could try changing the contact energy, lambda volume, the cell volume of the cell change. And for each one of those, you could explore how changing that parameter changes the way the system behaves. Now that's called sensitivity analysis. So that's one of the fundamental things that one has to do when you take simulations and try to make them take them for big games that we're playing to understand basic properties of mechanisms to actually making them match the biology. So... So actually, that that simulation is one that I, I encourage you to look at because it's got good code to, to plunder for other purposes. The other thing that is I want to talk about briefly uh, is that I mentioned that the cells in our, in our simulations here, we've assumed that the effective force of the cell, the velocity of the cell, should be proportional to the gradient. And that means in particular that if I double the concentration everywhere, the gradient is twice as steep and so the cell moves twice as fast. Now in reality, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the cell doesn't move with the chemical potential. The cell moves by sensing the gradient and then assembling its cytoskeletal machinery, its motors to drive in a given direction, to move in a given direction. The cell motors, have a speed limit of their own. And so what we find is that in reality, cells are quite good at moving up chemical gradients, but unless the gradient is very, very weak indeed, the cell moves with almost constant velocity independent of the concentration. In other words, the cells adapt so that they move uh, with a speed that's more or less independent of the concentration. In other words, think of it this way. You're hungry and you want to go home. The speed with which you drive home, well, up to a point, it may be regulated by how hungry you are. But if there's a speed limit of 30 miles per hour, you're probably not going to drive more than 40 miles per hour, no matter how hungry you are. And so this is a little bit like that. And in particular, we'll find that if we have very large gradients, for example, we have exponential gradients rather than linear ones, which are typical when there's decay, then when we get to regions with high gradients, the cells will move very fast, they'll break down, they'll disappear, because the forces produced by the chemical field are too big. 
Remember, when we started with chemical fields, we had linear gradient, and then we introduced the concept of decay, and we got exponential gradients. So exponential gradients are more typical than linear gradients in biology. And so one of the things that you could do is you could uh, create an exponential gradient by having a global decay in that first simulation where we had uh, the, the linear gradient turn on decay in that and see what the cells do. And maybe we could do this next week. Um, and you'll find in that case, the cell moves very slowly initially and then speeds up very rapidly like that. And we could fix that problem, or at least we could fix that problem if we think the biology doesn't correspond to it, by having the cell sense not the gradient, but the gradient of the logarithm of the chemical field. And there's an option in CompuCell called log chemotaxis that will do that. And so that'll be an exercise that will probably be set as a homework assignment, and then Pedro next week can go over that with you in class. Pedro, is that okay? As an exercise for, for class for next week? Yeah, yeah. it is. Okay. So I, I, think, I, I think that that's where we'll stop for today. Um, I hope that that was useful for people. And I appreciate people being willing to screen share and even when you were stuck, walk through the steps and, and try to get everything working together. Um, I will be away next week. Pedro will take over for me. Uh, I want to thank him. Uh, by the way, that, that self-constructed gradient, I think Pedro was the one who wrote that simulation originally. So we should, uh, uh, we should thank him for having done that. Uh, Pedro is quite, was quite interested, uh, in uh, collective migration, how how interacting agents give rise to interesting flocking behavior. And that self-constructed gradient is a nice example of that. Okay, so please uh, do work on your uh, projects. Uh, I, I, as I say, I will be here tomorrow and I can meet briefly with people tomorrow. Uh, and then I'm gonna be away for a week. So, uh, Hayden it will be around, though, if you need to want to talk about project ideas or problems with uh, homework or other things. Okay? Thanks, everybody. And I want to thank you for, again, for being uh, good sports about uh, exploring how these things work together. Bye.